I uh, was born a Christian. Growing <laughs> up, started to struggle with Christianity. Sure. It never made necessarily logical sense to me that a human could be God. But then I just started looking at the Bible. And from what I've read, I've only seen that Jesus ever says he's a subordinate to God. So I can never claim to understand any type of trinity where he is God. You're assuming that if Jesus is subordinate to the Father, he cannot be equal to him in nature. Well, that does not follow. You're subordinate to your Father, aren't you? Sure. So are you less human than your Father? No. You're confusing categories. You can be subject to one and yet equal to him in another sense. So you're subject to your Father in terms of authority, but equal to him in nature. So the same scriptures where Jesus is subject to the Father are the same scriptures where Jesus claims things that only God can claim, which even the Quran acknowledges. Subornation does not imply inferiority of essence and nature. You can have two parties who are equal in essence, but one subject to the other. So if you open up from Luke 2.51, now here, look what the text says. Jesus in Luke 2.51, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth, Nazareth, and was submissive to them. No one would think that because Jesus is subject to Mary and his adoptive father, Joseph, that he's less human than them, correct? Correct. Okay, so now with that out of the way, let me show you statements where even the Quran, because you are a Muslim, I'm assuming, right? Because Yusuf, you yep. convert Islam. Yep. Okay, let me show you where that same Jesus then claims things that even the Quran acknowledges only God can claim. Chapter 22, 6 and 7. I want you to see what even the Quran says that are functions and characteristics belonging only to God. Now, I obviously don't think that Allah the Quran is God, but for argument's sake, we're not going to debate that. <clears throat> so it says that is because Allah, he is the truth. And it is he who gives life to the dead. And it is he who is able to do all things. Verse 7. And surely the hour is coming. There is no doubt about it. And certainly Allah will resurrect those who are in the graves. So I want you to pay attention that the Quran says it is Allah who will give life to those who are in the graves. He will resurrect them. And Allah is the truth, al haq If you've ever studied Sunni Islam, you have what's called Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat, meaning that there are certain characteristics and names belonging uniquely to Allah. One of the 99 names of Allah is al haq the truth, the reality, like right here in verse 6. He is the truth. This is why in Islam, no God-fearing prophet can be called al haq the truth. You won't find that anywhere in the Quran where that is ascribed to anyone but Allah. But now, notice Jesus, who's not the Father. Remember, Allah gives life to the dead. He is the truth. And he'll raise them from the grave. The Gospels have Jesus claiming what the Quran ascribes to Allah. And yet he's not the Father. John 5, 21. Read it from. All right. So it says, for as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. So right there. Not the Father, but he can do everything the Father does, mm -hmm. such as give life. But now watch the connection with chapter 22, Surah Al-Hajj. Now read John 5, 25. Truly, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Now, what does that sound like? Didn't we just read in 22 verse 7? Allah is the one who gives life to those in the graves and brings them out? At the hour. You read yeah. that? Right? Um, I'm, I have my Quran in front of me. Um, yeah. It goes a lot more in depth because it's, a, I guess, a commentary Quran. Um, at four perspective, I'm just going to turn around my screen. It's quite a lot larger um, in terms yeah, of the Whatever verse. perspective you give me, that's not the text itself. In 22.7, read it for me. 22 verse 7. All right, 22 verse 7. That is because Allah is self-sustaining and all-sustaining, and that it is he who brings the dead to life, and that he has power over all things. Yeah, Jesus says he's the one who's going to raise the dead by his voice on the last hour. Can you show me someone in the Quran other than Allah who at the hour, Yom al qiyamah will be the one who raised the dead from their graves? Uh, I don't believe so, no. But Jesus said he's the one who's going to do it. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Now read 28, 29. Yep. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So if you had read the Gospels, my question to you is, how is it that here Jesus, not the Father, does everything that your Quran says only Allah will do? Allah is the truth, Al-Haq. Allah will raise the dead from their graves at that hour. Jesus says, that's me. I don't take um, the Bible as a proper uh, no, 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 no. you're not gonna run with because what was your argument i'm gonna now nail you against the wall because this is what you did you're the one who said that when you read the bible you right. see jesus is subordinate right by you now attacking the authority of the bible you just admit that yes if i accept the bible jesus claims to be god in the flesh you just change your argument so which is it what do you want me to address with well do you at least admit that jesus claimed to be god he has the power let's say if we're only using the bible i will put the quran aside for that 
if he's saying he has the power to bring back people from the dead. That's not the argument. Repeat my argument because you're not listening. Now I'm starting to question whether you're actually listening. That wasn't the argument. Let me repeat the argument. On the last day, the day of resurrection, Yom Tiyama, both Old Testament Quran agree, God and God alone will raise the dead physically from their graves. That's the argument. I didn't say to raise the dead. Yet here Jesus says, he on the last day, he by his voice will raise the dead physically and then he's going to judge them. On top of that, Jesus claims to be the resurrection and the life. John 11, 25. Those are also names of Allah. One of the names of Allah is al bayyith the resurrector, and as well as <clears throat> the living one. Jesus says, I am the resurrection of life. So deal with the argument. Someone ask it again. Can you show me anyone in your Quran, even in the Old Testament, besides Allah, who says, I am the resurrection, the life, the truth, and I will raise it, resurrect the dead on the last day? You cannot find no one in the Old Testament nor Quran. No. So can you now admit at least, for argument's sake, what Jesus just claimed is something only God can claim. I could agree to that, yes. Okay, so then that means you got your answer. Because your original question is, you don't see the Trinity. You see that Jesus is to the Father. Okay, so they... Okay. Um, do they all have separate wills? I've always been confused about it. No, so I think uh, all classical Trinitarian theology, whether East or West, believes that in God there's only one will because will is a property of nature. And so if God has one essence or nature. Uh, you couldn't have multiple competing wills. So they all have one will, but they uniquely actualize any triadic or Trinitarian action in their unique mode of persons. So the Father is the beginning of every action in the Trinity. The Son manifests it and the Spirit manifests it as well in a unique, unified way. So there's one there's one triad acting, but it's uniquely actualized by each person. But there's not competing wills. They all share the same will. That's why in the Incarnation, which answers your previous uh, statement about it doesn't make sense to say that a man could be God. Well, that's why we say that in the hypostatic union, as it's called, there's two natures that are united in a single divine person of the Son. So he assumes a human nature. He always retains that human nature. It doesn't become non-human or it doesn't go away. He doesn't shed it. He's always forever united to the humanity that he assumed. And that's why there's always two natures. And that's why he's always fully God and fully man. All right. Now, before, no, I don't want you to leave. Uh, I want to show you something. This is Hadith Qudsi. Do you know what a Hadith Qudsi is? Uh, I'm not too, too familiar. No. Let me explain that. According to the Sunni tradition, there are times in which Muhammad quotes Allah. So okay. it's not Muhammad speaking. It's Allah speaking. But they're not found in the Quran. They're found in the Hadith. Look what Allah says. So it says on the authority of Abu Huraira, uh, the messenger of Allah said, Allah, he will say on the day of resurrection, O son of Adam, I fell ill and you visited me not. He will say, O Lord, how, and how should I visit you when you are the Lord of the world? He will say, did you not know that my servant so-and-so had fallen ill and you visited him not? Did you not know that had you visited him, you would have found me with him? O oh, son of Adam, I asked you for food and you fed me not. He will say, Lord, how should I feed you when you're the Lord of the world? He will say, did you not know that my servant so-and-so asked you for food and you fed him not? Did you not know that I had that had you fed him, you would surely have found that with me? O oh, son of Adam, I asked you to give me drink and you gave me not to drink. He will say, O oh, Lord, how should I give you drink when you're the Lord of the world? He will say, my servant so-and-so asked you to give him drink and you gave him not to drink. Had you given him to drink, you would have surely found that with me. Okay, so it's a Sahih narration. Now, understand what the narration is claiming, that when you treat someone kindly and feed them, it's as if you're feeding Allah. So by feeding a Muslim or someone eat, you're feeding Allah metaphorically because of Allah's love for his servants. So you catch that, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, but now I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. Now, you agree that no creature will be the one on the day of judgment saying, oh, Yusuf, I was hungry, you didn't feed me. What do you mean? When, when you saw my servant, my Abd, and you didn't feed him, you didn't feed me. Because that's the prerogative of Allah. He's the, he's the Malik Yomadin, right? Okay, now, Matthew 25, 31 and 46. Muhammad took the words of Jesus and he attributed it to Allah. So he just indirectly admitted Jesus claimed to be God. Mm -hmm. Matthew 25, 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Now, before he moves on, understand, this is Jesus speaking. Mm -hmm. In chapter 88, verse 85, 15 of the Quran, it says, Allah is the owner of the glorious th throne. Allah is the owner of the glorious throne. 85, 15. Mm. It doesn't belong to a creature. But Jesus says, he's the son of man. He comes with the angels. He sits on his glorious throne. Mm -hmm. Now watch what's going to happen. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit 
I want them to hear this. Notice Jesus just claimed all the nations will stand before him in judgment. He'll be sitting on a glorious throne. All nations, everyone. That means you and me. That means even Muhammad, whether you believe it or not. If you don't believe it, that's fine. I'm just letting you know. And then Jesus speaking himself says, the king will say. So Jesus just claimed to be the king of the day of judgment and that God is his father. Because look what he says. Come, you are blessed of my father. So God is his father. So this is a son of God. He is the king of the day of judgment. He sits on a glorious throne, will judge all nations. The whole nations will stand before him and answer to him. Now watch what's going to happen. Keep reading. He says, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison. And you came to me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you as a stranger and welcome you? Or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Now, Yusuf, hang on to your hat, because here is the part I want you to listen to and tell me if it sounds familiar. 41. Mm. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. You cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. Sounds familiar, Yusuf? Yeah, so that sounds exactly like the cities. Um, oh, but what came first? So the Bible has came first. And why is it Jesus is saying the words that Muhammad ascribed to Allah? Then who's Jesus claiming to be? But let him finish it. I was hungry, you did not feed me. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or, or in prison or sick and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So in this saying of Jesus, he says he's Lord, Rab, he's the king, medic of the day of judgment. He sits on a glorious throne, according to chapter 85, 15 of the Quran. Allah owns the glorious throne. All nations stand before him. He will determine whether you go to hell or heaven. And he says the very things that Muhammad said Allah will say. Allah will say, you didn't feed me. You didn't give me to drink. You didn't visit me. Everything Jesus says, Muhammad put in the words of Allah. So now can you admit that at least as far as this saying goes, Jesus is claiming to be God Almighty, the Lord and the King of the Day of Judgment? I will agree from the stuff you gave me, yes. So then why did you leave the Trinity if you're reading the Gospels? Well. There's a few contradictions, I believe, in the Bible. So now we're going to biblical authority. So, But we now abandon the Trinity. So first you said the problem with Trini the Christianity is the Trinity. didn't make sense. You didn't find the Bible. So now it's another argument. So at least you now admit that the B Gospels, you didn't read carefully, depict Jesus as God, and yet he's not the Father, not the Spirit, correct? I renounced my previous claim, yes. Okay. So we got that out of the way. I just want to make clear. So I don't need to give you another example where Jesus claims to be God, though he's not the Father, not the Spirit. That's why true believers have affirmed the Trinity. So we got that out of the way. You want anything, Jay? Because I just wanted to... So the second now, your objection was, now, let's be honest. Yeah, before, be honest. You, before you move into that, Sam, before you move into that, that segment. Hey, guys, so for the people who are hitting the link, this is for Muslims only, all right? I thought that the link made that clear. It says Muslims join. So if you're not a Muslim and you're in the back, please remove yourselves because you're wasting. I only have a limited space for the Muslim guests who are trying to come up and I have a lot of people. So if you're here and you're not a Muslim, I need you to do me a favor, respect the stream and please watch from YouTube. All right. Um, Cause you're wasting space for the Muslims to come and join. Also guys, uh, we are at a total of 5,400 people watching. What? Yeah. We're killing it right now. We got hey, we're five thousand. viral in here. I'm struggling, bro. What? The yeah, well, well, no, man. This, 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 this is it right now. God is blessing the stream. So we got, we got forty six hundred here, seven hundred on your channel, um, uh, Sam. So combined, we got fifty four hundred. So guys, make sure you guys hit the like button on both on both channels. Sam's channel, yep. my channel, right now. Everybody that's watching. Hit the like button. Let's even get it higher than this. Let's hit yep. 6,000 today. And Let's I got 100 on Mumble, mister. But anyway. Oh, now, nice. Good. Now, just come back. Let me know how much time you want to take. Now, before I even let you, because I know where you're going to go with Bible discrepancies. I heard it. Now, when you were not a Muslim and you read the Bible, okay, because this argument of biblical discrepancies usually comes up after the fact when someone has already lost faith in the Bible, wants to find reasons to justify not believing the Bible. So when you read the Bible, you've read the entire collection of the books of the Bible. And on your own, independent of someone telling you, you discovered the contradictions on no. your own. No. Okay, see, that's good. So this is why I like you. You're being very honest. So now you found people bringing alleged contradiction in the Bible. Did you then bother 
to then read the responses that have been offered by Christians for thousands of years, nothing new under the sun. For example, on my own website, I uploaded a multi-part series by Jay Smith and team to supposedly 101 contradictions by Shabrali, 101 cleared up contradictions. So have you ever taken the time to study at least to see what the Christian response was? A few specific ones, I will say. I have not done research on every little bit of it though. So I'll say no for the sake of argument. Yeah, no. Now, let me ask a related question. Have you then examined over the hundred contradictions that we have documented from the Quran and our responses to the Muslim attempt of harmonizing them? I have not, no. Exactly. So notice what you're doing here. And I'm saying this, I want you to see it. When it came to the Bible and you lost faith, you rushed to find reasons to justify rejection, saw the alleged discrepancies, only read a few responses, but then you jumped into Islam without forced thoroughly investigating pros and cons. You listen to Muslims giving you a positive case, but you never listen to the opposing side and see if they had any weight and whether the Muslim responses could stand up to the responses to their defenses. So what do I mean? Proverbs 18, 17 states, this is wisdom from the true God. Proverbs 18, 17 states, the first to present his case seems right until his neighbor comes and questions him. So why did you just jump into Islam without hearing all sides of the issue and seeing whether the Quran can stand up to the criticisms and whether the Islamic concept of God is true and logically coherent? Because this is the reasons why you reject the Bible and Christianity. So as far as reasons why I jumped, um, I just didn't feel God. I mean, I, I'm not going to put it every other type of way. Um, and then while, whenever I left, I was considered myself an agnostic. Um, and then I found Islam and it seemed to have more of the um, beliefs I already had instilled with uh, the lack of Trinity. So I've gone back now. Um, my... I'm going to Bible study groups uh, every Thursday, Sunday, and I try and get on discussions to try and talk about these things. And as far as Quran goes, I don't really have people who um, describe the Quran to me. I only go online because I'm here in St. Louis, Missouri. I mean, I don't really have many uh, Muslim people around me at all. So it's a little bit different in that case. Okay. Jay, you want to say something before I chime in? Yeah, I would just comment. I, I think that one of the things you said there about, um, you know, I didn't really feel God. I don't know what your previous tradition was. You said it was kind of anti-Trinitarian. Uh, I mean, I don't think that you would feel God in a situation where they don't confess the full deity of the spirit. So um, that might be part of it, but also uh, we shouldn't, we can't decide these issues on the basis of how we feel anyway, right. because we know from Jeremiah, for example, our heart is deceptive and it can deceive us. And so if we go by what we feel, you know, we might not feel like we believe in God two weeks from now. So it has to be rooted in more than feelings. It has to be rooted in which position actually has the better yeah, argumentation. I, I understand where you're going with it. It's illogical. I mean, it has to be. Like, there's no other way to, to go about it. Who's got the better position? So now, my, my other problem with you bringing alleged Bible discrepancies. Now, if you renounce Islam, that's one thing. But if you're going to remain faithful, and this is part of the debates we've just had in the last two weeks. Jay and I debated two Muslims. Even this young brother here debated John Fontaine. You cannot hold to Islam and claim the Bible is corrupted and full of contradictions. So this is a dilemma for you. Now, if you renounce Islam and say, well, I reject Muhammad, we can talk about these discrepancies and how to harmonize them. But since you're a Muslim, you need to know about the Islamic dilemma. He just debated John Fontaine. And again, I'm biased, but I try to be honest. It was a slaughter on the topic of whether the Quran confirms the Bible we possess. Jay and I, again, I'm biased. It was a slaughter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm biased. I mean, I'm just- well, I've watched all three of your recent debates. I saw okay. him debate Ramsey. I saw you guys okay. debate- uh, Daniel, and I saw you debate um, uh, Muslim Lantern. So yeah. so my question to you is, the evidence is overwhelming. And I'm, that's why we challenge the big boys to come and put us in our place for freedom. us. If you follow the Quran, Muhammad confirmed the scriptures of the Jews and Christians. Historically, textually, archaeologically, there's no way around this. The only scriptures they had is what we have today. He didn't say they've been corrupted and there's a kernel of truth in them. No, no. One of the arguments he gave for his prophet, I can give you the verses right here. You can bring up the Quran. Is that this is how you're going to know the Quran is true. The Quran confirms and verifies what you have. And what you have is the uncorrupt revelations of God and agrees with them. That's how you know the Quran is true. But then the Jews and Christians said, well, you contradict what we have. So then Muhammad accused them of misinterpretation, twisting it by their tongue. Chapter 3, verse 78. So now that's a dilemma for you. If you want to convince me the Bible has errors, then you need to become an agnostic again. You can't remain Muslim. To give you an, an example what I mean. As a Christian committed to the New Testament, I can't attack the Old Testament. Now, it would be much easier if Jesus not confirmed the Old Testament because we have to explain away a lot of the things in the Old Testament, issues of slavery, whatever. But because Jesus in my New Testament and his followers confirmed the Old Testament as historically accurate in the Word of God, I have no business attacking and saying it's corrupt, it's fables. 
because that means I'm faithless to Christ. That's your dilemma. When you attack the Bible, you're saying Muhammad didn't know what he was talking about. So then why are you a Muslim? So your argument is, um, and interrupt me if I'm wrong here. Yes. You're saying the Quran affirms the Bible, correct? Yes. And the Quran is your authority, right? Correct. So I'm appealing to your authority, not mine. It's like if a Jew says to me, just clarify, if a Jew comes to me and says, hey, you can't attack the Old Testament because you believe in the New Testament, he'd be right. Now he can attack the New Testament, he doesn't believe in it. So I'm in the position of the Jew in that I can attack your Quran because I'm not obligated to follow it, but you can't attack my Bible if you follow the Quran. Yeah, so what you're um, referencing, I don't believe in the Quran, it says that the scriptures um, are here in hand. What? You want to bet? How much you want to bet? Boy, what, what you putting on that ticket? You know, over, we want me to bombard you with the verses? In chapter 2, verses 40 to 44? I'll just give you a slew and he'll bring them up. Let me just give you a few of many. Chapter 2, Surat al-Baqarah, 40 to 44. Chapter 2, this all in Surat al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 89, verse 91, verse 97, verse 101, verse 113, verse 121. That's just in chapter 2. We'll, we'll go through them. Chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Chapter 3, verse 50. Chapter 4, verse 47. Chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. Surat al-Maidah, chapter 5, verse 66. And 68. Okay, so that's chapter 5. Then we can go <clears throat> to chapter 46, verse 12 and 30. But then if we go a little earlier, we go to chapter 10, verse 37. And then we can include chapter 6, verse 115 and 1827, that none can corrupt the words of Allah. And that's just some of the many I can appeal to. And then if I go to the Hadith, it's, it's burial. What do you mean it doesn't? Muhammad is confirming, he says, what you have with you. This confirms what you have with you. You can, you can show you the verses. We can begin with Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter two, verse forty to forty-four. Yeah, let's just stay. Let's just stay in chapter two for a second. Yeah, here. just you go. You know the verse, right? Yeah, let's just stay in chapter two. So here's here it is. I got the verse. Forty to forty-four. It's okay. You can start at forty-one. Yep, got them lined up on the on the right side here. Chapter two, verse yeah, forty-one. Why don't you remove the Bible so you can see the larger screen for now? Oh, is it too small? It looks. Well, like... I don't know if he can see it. I don't, know. I don't care about hey, it. Can you see it, Yusuf? You good here? You know, let me <laughs> let me do it like this. Let me do it like this. Hold on. Let's do it this way. And since since Sam think he know how to how to do this. No, stuff. for him, man. I'm, I'm not gonna read it. No, it's for you. You couldn't see it. Well, yeah, and I need glasses. <laughs> but I am hit weight, so I'm getting buff. So all right. So all right. So chapter two, verse 41 says, And believe in what in that I have sent down, confirming that which is with you, okay. and be not the first to disbelieve in it. And sell not my signs for a little price, and fear you me. And do not confound the truth with vanity, and do not conceal the truth wittingly. And perform the prayer, and pay the alms, and bow, and bow with those who bow. Will you bid others to piety, and forget yourselves while you recite the book? Do you not understand? So let's just break this down really quick. So the verse just said that the scripture is there with them in their hands. It's in their possession. Not only is it there with them in their possession, but they are reciting it. They're reading it, right, Yusuf? Chapter 2, verse 89. When there came to them a book from God, confirming that, confirming what was with them. So the Quran came in, confirming what is with them, what they have in their hands. And they aforetimes prayed for victory over the unbelievers. When there came to them that they recognized, they disbelieved in it, and the curse of God is on the believer, un unbelievers. 92, 91. And when, they're, and when they were told, believe in what God has sent down, talking about the Quran again, they said, we believe in what was sent down to us, and they disbelieve in what is beyond that. Yet it is the truth confirming what is with them. So the Quran came down confirming what the Jews and the Christians presently had in their hands that they were reading and reciting and judging by. Say, why then were you slaying the prophets of God in former time? if you were believers. Chapter 2, verse 101. When there has come to them a messenger from God, confirming what was with them, a party of them that were given the book reject the book of God behind their backs as though they knew not. That's all just in chapter 2. Yep. Okay. We can give you more now. He's going to ask you the question because I can read hearts. What did they have at the time, Muhammad? What were the books they had at that time? Am I right? That's what you're going to ask him maybe? That's the next question. What <laughs> was with them? <laughs> you a prophet? <laughs> yeah, well, not for profit, though. I don't make much money. So, yeah, that's the question. What did they have with them? What books? Uh, should be the uh, Torah, Zebur, and the Angel. Exactly. Good man, Yusuf. I want to kiss your head. Exactly. So then how can you say it's corrupt? You just admit it was there. From everything you have said, if everything is correct, and obviously I'll go back before I just make the jump. Uh, I don't try and do too many leaps. Yep. Yeah. Um, I would renounce Islam. You need well, to. That's the whole point. Study. Um, I will say from the translations that you put up there, my Quran doesn't give nearly as what you're saying. As far as Surah 2, verse 41, it says, oh, Read it for us. Read in your own translation. Yeah, it says, O children of Israel, remember my favor, which I bestowed upon you and fulfilled your covenant with me. I will fulfill my covenant with you and me alone, should you fear. You said that was... What? Uh, no, no, no. Two? No, no, no. Maybe it's a different versification because it's chapter 240 to 44. 
but it should be in your 41. Then if it's not 41, read 42. Because you may have been reading 40, or you may have a different versification. It might read. be a different versification. I think that's yeah. going to be it. No, read the next one, because it's going to follow. So, so it says, it. and believe in what I have sent, which is yes. that which is with you. Well, uh, so how's it read differently? You're trying to say that which is with you. It'd be not. Yeah, 77, the commentary. Yeah, they can. Commentary is one thing. A Muslim, if he's already bent on destroying the Bible, he's going to explain it away. So I could care less what a commentary says. I want to go with the text. So you see it says, confirming what is with you? Uh, yeah, it says. Sense. And then we have 44? This is 42. You said 44. And well, if it's a different versification. It'll be 45 for him. Read 45. Yeah. It says, do you enjoin others to do what is good and forget your own selves while you read the book? How can they read the book if they don't have it? Yeah. it I mean... Yep. The commentary explained it, but you don't care for the commentary. Buddy, I'm not going well, to. You know, I love you, Yusuf. I can bring you the study Quran commentary by Muslims, and they'll tell you that the Quran presupposes the Bible is uncorrupt. You can read their notes in chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. They say that the Torah and the Gospel are still valid. Commentary is not written by people who are inspired, and they have biases like I do. So if you have a Muslim who's going to comment who thinks the Bible's corrupt, he's going to explain this away. So you keep depending on commentaries. Well, the study Quran, which Jay has, which I've actually quoted in their notes on 5, 43 to 48, it says that the Torah and the gospel are still validly binding on Jews and Christians. They should follow it. So they're affirming the Quran does not teach the Bible's corrupt. So would you accept the opinion of these Muslim scholars? Well, that's the, my point. You get two people, you're going to get 50 opinions. I'm saying the text. What does the text say? It says it's with them. They're reading it. Yeah, I agree. Um, this was one of the issues I had with Islam whenever I first started reading. It has such a dependency on knowing Arabic. Um, to well, even... that's what they tell you. But well, did you know without the Quran, you can't, uh, without the Bible, you can't make heads or tails out of the Quran. Let me prove it to you. You said, now you let me know how much time you want to take. I know there's, but this guy really is on my heart. No, he's, yeah, he's, he's genuine. We, we could take as much time as we need with him. I mean, he's, he's genuine. He's honest. I, I'd rather talk to him all day yeah, than exactly. the heads we're going to see later on. But here I'm going to show you why your Quran assumes the Bible. For example, I'm going to ask you questions and you won't find the answers in the Quran. Adam's wife, what was her name? Eve. But I know, yeah, Eve. Eve in the Bible, right? Yeah. There's not a single verse in the Quran that tells you what her name is. No women are mentioned by name except the mother of Christ. Secondly, in chapter 5, verses 20, now you have a different versification, maybe 20, but anyway, chapter 5, verses 20 to 26, it says, the two sons of Adam argued one killed the other. What are their names? Okay, I, I see where you're going. Okay, right. Quran doesn't tell you. You don't know what their names are. You don't know who killed who. Now, it says, Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob, they all belong to Abraham. Did they have different mothers or the same mother? They all had different mothers. Not according to the Quran. Show me that. Fair enough. Um, I'd have to look. I know I've seen. No, I'm telling you, doesn't know. The Quran doesn't even know that Abraham had different sons from different women. In fact, if you read chapter 11, the one wife that is alluded to is the mother of Isaac, but we're not even told her name. We're not even told her name. And if I ask you, Jesus, what are the name of his disciples? Because in chapter 3, verse 52, and chapter 5, verse 111, it says that the disciples of Jesus said, bear witness for Muslims. Who are they? What are their names? And when did Jesus minister? Well, I mean, it's uh, Mark or Matthew, Luke, John, uh, not. Oh, you have to go back to my Bible. That's my yeah, point. Yeah, I, I see where you're going with it. Okay, so why would I want to follow a poor copycat that comes in the 7th century, supposedly, which depends on a Bible that exposes it as a fraud. So you can't do without my Bible. You need my Bible to make sense out of it. But then when my Bible contradicts it, oh, your Bible's corrupt. So in other words, it's circular reasoning. I will accept the Bible when it helps me out with the Quran, but I'll reject the Bible when it proves the Quran is a fraud. This is called circular reasoning yeah um it's hard to uh explain that the way i've always been taught about the bible as a uh muslim it's there can be parts that are true <laughs> um, the parts that agree with the quran right yeah because the way <laughs> it works is some of those words are misattributed to god so but how do you know that the parts that agree with the quran are true because that assumes the quran is true by the way yeah. Jay, that's your forte i don't want to be jumping in if you want to go ahead well and on top of that too like just think about the logic of saying that we go to a corrupt book to confirm the Quran is true. I mean, that itself is fallacious.